McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop, Season 2, Episode 3, Gas Mask. October 2nd, 1921, continued. It's a bit later, diary. I am bored stiff. As a matter of fact, all of me is stiff. My legs are stiff, my arms are stiff. Pardon me for being vulgar, but my tutu is the stiffest of all. Pretty soon, I'm going to grow into this cage, and that will be the end of it. I'll never get out. The three night enthusiasts are still lounging around, waiting for Wrath to return. The wooden carousel horse, with its twisted expression of pain, looks up at them reproachfully. At this point, the night enthusiasts have calmed down a bit. They were as tense as could be for the first hour, as though Wrath was going to appear any moment. Now, they're getting bored. They're sitting. One of them is lying down. I'm thinking of chucking bits of spit paper into the nearest one's hat. I've got nothing better to do. I wasn't doing a very good job of escaping before these three guards showed up, but now that they're here, I'm doing even worse. I just tried teleporting again. I shut my eyes and wished for McGillicuddy and Murder's pawn shop. I've done that before, of course. It doesn't work. It isn't possible to teleport. But I keep trying. The thing is, I'm not entirely sure how my unique magic unusual power works. I can break spells just by speaking. Wonderful. So far, so good. But is it that simple? What if there's a particular phrasing I have to use? I release Wrath from his train car, but I don't remember what I said exactly. That's the only time I've ever broken a spell. What if it comes down to cadence, inflection, number of words used? How am I supposed to know how it works? And there's no one to teach me how to do it right, because I'm the only magic unusual in the world who has this power. So I keep trying things, saying words over and over in a different way, with different patterns, in case I can break the spell. There's some kind of magic keeping me in this cage, or in the cave itself. If I can just break whatever spell the night enthusiasts used to trap me here, I can get out. But they know about my power. They've known about it for some time. It's why they want me on their side, so they can exploit it. If they knew about my power ahead of time, surely they were prepared. I think perhaps they found a way to block my power. Somehow. I wish I knew how they did it. But, in case they didn't block my power, I'm going to keep trying to teleport. I've been muttering under my breath for the last minute or two, and a few of the night enthusiasts have looked over, annoyed. Honestly, they're treating me like a sheep in the zoo. Diary, it's a bit later, and if it's possible to feel worse, then I do. The night enthusiast guards, bored, began to talk about things. Mostly stupid things like who's winning at baseball, and whether or not one of them, named Fred, is going to propose to the girl he likes. But then they started talking about... Well... Did you hear about Noble James? One asked. Noble James? Yes. He turned traitor, didn't he? I don't know about that. All I heard was there was an accident. He was stabbed. Was he? Yes, but that was weeks ago. I mean, did you hear the new news? What? No. He's dead. My heart plunged into my shoes. I shut my eyes. In a way I'd known it already, but it felt awful to hear. Poor Noble. That, on top of everything else made me feel desperate to escape. And then, all of a sudden, I got an idea. Let me recount for you, my dearest diary, what I've been noticing so far about this cave. 1. None of the night enthusiasts have teleported out of it. That's quite true. It took me a while to notice it, because we've all teleported into the cave. People arrive all the time. But when they leave, they take the door. Always unless they're me being force-fed a potion, or Wrath and the small woman, using a murder object. I think perhaps the cave has a spell blocking anyone from teleporting out directly. So far so good, that makes it a worthy prison. You can come, but you can't leave. But I've seen two people leave, and that's by using a murder object. The cave's spell doesn't apply to murder objects. When you use one, the cave lets you out. Of course, it looks like you can't get back any other way. 
but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. First things first, I'm going to get my hands on a murder object. October 3rd, 1921. There were no murder objects within reach of my cage. Of course there weren't. The night enthusiasts would have thought of that. But I spotted a tiny crystal ball, blue and green like the ocean, just out of my grasp. My plan began to take shape. My back itches, I wailed. One of the night enthusiasts looked over at me in complete stupefaction. I tried to be as whiny as possible, which, let's face it, is not very difficult for me. I can't reach the itch, I fussed. One of the night enthusiasts looked at me with a snide grin. I could probably reach it, sweetheart. Honestly, the nerve. Get me a stick or something, I said. Ow! Oh! I fussed and dithered and made myself as annoying as possible until one of them, with a groan, got up and handed me a pen from his jacket pocket. There, he said. Will that shut you up? Yes, I said. I took it meekly as he passed it through the bars. For show, I scratched my back. He waited for me to return the pen. I grinned impishly. Now I can draw pictures on my hands, I said. Thanks a lot. Hey, he said. I'm bored in here, I pouted. It's the least you can do. With a sigh, he wandered back to the carousel horse. And I had what I wanted. I waited for the night enthusiasts to grow bored and start talking again. Even better, they soon started a game of cards. Two of their backs were to me, so only one of them could see me. I shifted and yawned and wormed my way over to the left side of the cage. Then, with the pen extended in the tips of my fingers, I reached my hand through the bars. Two things happened at once, then. I hit the small crystal ball with my pen, and it rolled beautifully, obediently towards me. The second thing that happened was that wrath came back. I was about to pick up the crystal ball when the night enthusiast suddenly shouted. One screeched as if he were in pain. Wrath! laughing hysterically, bounded into the cave. Once more, the room was filled with the syrupy, metallic scent of blood. Wrath stood inside the circle of night enthusiasts, still laughing. They pointed their weapons at him. They shouted. Wrath held a large metal canister, as well as a leathery mass in his left hand. "'Put it down!' one of the night enthusiasts shouted. "'Put it down!' Wrath, with a grin, flopped the leathery thing onto his head. It was a mask. It had giant glass eyes like an insect. Wrath turned a knob on his metal canister. One of the night enthusiasts screamed. Yellow fumes poured from the canister. It was gas. Wrath had gone into 1916 to bring back gas. One of the night enthusiasts fired. The bullet struck Wrath, but he seemed to be unaffected. Sorry, boys, more wood than flesh now. Wrath looked over at me, light glinting in the mask's giant, bulbous eyes. I'd leave if I were you, he said. I snatched up the crystal ball, and I wished to get out, anywhere. With a lurch in the pit of my stomach, I left the cave of the night enthusiasts. We hope you've enjoyed season two. Episode 3, Gas Mask, of McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop is written and performed by Minerva Sweeney Wren, all rights reserved. Visit MinervaSweeneyWren.com to see photographs of the real McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop, and learn how you can support the show, keep it advertisement-free, and explore more stories by Minerva Sweeney Wren. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop will continue with Season 2, Episode 4, Safe to Return. <laughs>